thank God for the opportunity to serve Him day by day. We thank God that He's with us during beautiful days and during days that aren't so beautiful. That each day is the day that He has made. Let us pray before the message this morning. Lord, we just thank You for the opportunity to be here. We pray that You will speak to our hearts through this message. May we be encouraged. May we be built up in our faith and in our desire to serve You. We ask in Jesus' precious name. The message this morning is entitled, Told to Tell. Told to Tell. Jesus tells us to tell others about Him. So as we look in the Bible, we see Jesus telling us to tell others about Him. Told to Tell. Pastor George Sweeney, in his book, The No Guilt Guide for Witnessing, tells of a man by the name of John Currier, who in 1949 was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life in prison. Later, he was transferred and paroled to work on a farm near Nashville, Tennessee. In 1968, Currier's sentence was terminated and a letter bearing the good news was sent to him. So he was on the farm from 1949 to 1968, and the letter was sent. But John never saw the letter, nor was he told anything about the letter. Life on the farm was hard and without promise for the future. Yet John kept doing what he was told even after the farmer for whom he worked had died. Ten years went by, so this is into 1978. Then a state parole officer learned about Courier's plight, found him, and told him that his sentence had been terminated, that he was a free man. Sweeney concluded the story by asking, would it matter to you if someone sent you an important message? The most important message in your life? And year after year, the urgent message was never delivered. We who have heard the good news and experienced freedom through Jesus Christ are responsible to proclaim it to others still enslaved by sin, still prisoners. Are we doing all we can to make sure that people get the message? Are we doing all we can to make sure people get the message? Jesus said in Acts 1 and verse 8, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world. So he says, you are to witness. You are to tell others about me. And in Matthew 28, 18 to 20, the Great Commission, he called his followers to go and to tell them, to tell others about him. Now this is a command. Go. It's not sit and think about it. It's a command to go. In 1 Peter 3.15, we're called to be always ready to give an answer to the hope that is within us. Telling others about Jesus is not an option, so why do we keep quiet? Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John 14.15. So we cannot say, let others talk about Jesus. It's not my responsibility. Because Jesus expects us to tell others about Him. So it's not an option. True heart of compassion will let those on the way to destruction know they can escape. But the only escape is through Jesus Christ. We need to tell people they're in trouble with God and that God alone has provided a way to escape. But how? Do we all have to share the same way? Not really. The other unbelieving world is made up of a variety of people. Young people, old people, rich people, poor people, educated people, uneducated people, urban people, rural people, with different races, personalities, values, politics, and religious backgrounds. It's going to take more than one style of evangelism to reach 
set a diverse group of people. So there are many ways in which we can share our faith. In other words, one size does not fit all. What are some of the types or styles of evangelism? Sometimes it can, it can come down to our personalities. Sometimes we can become more comfortable in sharing our faith in one way than in other ways. What are some of the styles or ways of sharing our faith? One is confrontational. In Acts 2, repent and be baptized, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So that's a direct in your face. That's basically a direct in your face. You are lost and going to hell and separated from God. You need to repent type of evangelism. And there's sometimes God may put us in contact with something, someone just for a short period of time where he may use us in a confrontational type of way. But when we're confrontational, we need to do it in love. Not in a judgmental, unloving way. There's a way to confront in love and a way to confront in judgment. True? Yeah. So there's confrontational, very direct. There's intellectual. In Acts 17, Paul debated with the philosophers on Mars Hill to convince them, to convince them about the truthfulness of Jesus being the Son of God. Sometimes people need their brains to be convinced, right? This is making a case for Jesus. And we can ask for guidance by the Holy Spirit to do that. Sometimes people need the evidence in order to come to a decision for Jesus Christ. And God can give us the wisdom. We may use evidence of people being healed today with documented medical cases of people being healed after the medical authorities have written them off, yet in response to prayer, there have been people with stage 4 cancer, with MS, people who have come back from the dead in response to prayer. Document. Now that's a type of evidence, do you agree? That's a type of evidence that can convince someone intellectually. Or the fact that archaeology Discoveries are continuing to confirm the truthfulness of the Bible regarding cities and personalities that are mentioned in the Bible. Archaeology is confirming the truthfulness of the record of the Word of God. That's another way that we can speak to people's minds. So there's intellectual, there's testimonial. In John 9, one thing I know I do, one thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. This is personal. This is sharing our personal experience of how God changed us. Who but we know better than anyone else about what God has done in our life, true? So this, this is something we can share with others and prayerfully others who know us will see a difference in our life. From before and after. That people will be able to see, this person has changed. Why have they changed? What an opportunity to give our testimony that it is by the power of Jesus Christ working in our life that we have changed. So there's testimony. There's relational. In Mark 5, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you. Sharing with those who know you. Now this can be sometimes a more difficult type of sharing. I've shared before, when I first went home after coming to faith in Christ at 20 years of age and came home to my family and started sharing in my hometown, one of my sisters sat down next to me and blew smoke rings in my face from her cigarette and said, don't let anyone in this town know you're my brother. Now she knew I didn't like cigarette smoke. So she made it very clear that she was ashamed of having a brother who was standing up for Jesus. So sometimes sharing with our family members can really be the most difficult. Because they know us. They know how to get under our skin. But it's important to share with our family members and friends. 
There is invitational in John 4. The Samaritan woman at the well begged the people of the city to come and hear Jesus for themselves. Inviting others to come to, to church. Inviting others to think about Jesus in places like Tim Hortons. There are the people that have come to faith in Christ at tables at Tim Hortons. But they only came to faith in Christ through an invitation. As the gospel was presented to them. How can people come if they're not invited? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus is giving out an invitation. But we, who are ambassadors for Christ, are to physically give that invitation to others so that they may come to know Jesus. There is serving in Acts 9, Dorcas, impacted her city by doing deeds of kindness. Are we showing the love of Jesus to others by what we're doing? What are people seeing in us? Are people seeing us so, centered, so self centered that we have no time for anyone but ourselves? Or are people seeing that we have a caring, loving attitude in how we relate to others? I'm not saying we are to be in a situation where we're letting others use us. That's different. I'm saying, do we have that loving, caring attitude in helping others? Don't ever think that you're a second-class Christian because you don't proclaim Jesus like Peter or Paul. God has not all called us to be like Peter and Paul. Don't evaluate yourself by Peter and Paul. You are you. Discover your own method of sharing Christ. Then get out of your chair and use it for the glory of God. Live by faith, not by fear. I've chosen four reasons why people don't share their faith. There may be others, but I've chosen four specific reasons why many who have followed Jesus are keeping their mouths closed and not telling others about Jesus. Number one, fear. This is one of the biggest ones, fear. Fear they will lose relationships with family, with friends, with neighbors, with fellow work workers, so they, they keep quiet. <coughs> or they may fear that they may lose their job. I'm not saying that we're to, we're to when I was working full time in the government, I didn't use my work time to share my faith, I used my break time. Because I was paid to work. But during the time when I had my lunch or my break, I had opportunities to share my faith in Christ. Or even fear of losing our lives. There are countries where Christians are <coughs> persecuted. But they're not keeping quiet. They're sharing their faith. Sometimes we don't share our faith because we want people to like us. We, we don't want to rock the boat. We don't want people saying anything negative about us. So we don't want them labeling us a fanatic, so we keep quiet and hide our faith. Yet, we are told by Jesus to put him first. In Revelation 3.16, when Jesus talked to a lady in Laodicean church, a church that was committed to him, but also committed to material goods. They were trying to live both sides of the, uh, of the fence. And Jesus was saying, you can't be lukewarm. You're either hot or cold. You're, it's all or nothing in following me. There's no in-between. In Luke 14 and verse 26, as Jesus said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. What Jesus is saying, he's not saying go out and actively hate people. He is saying, where is your priority? What is your greatest priority? Am I first even before someone who you're married to, 
or members of your own family, am I first in your life? In 2 Corinthians 1.18, it says that we can expect reaction to the good news because the cross of Christ is an offense. The word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. We can expect rejection in sharing about Jesus. Not the rejection of who we are, but who we represent. Amen? Because people will find the message of the cross an offense. And we have been called to share that message. So we can expect opposition. First Peter 2, verses 7 to 8. So the honor is for you who believe, but for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense. John 15, 18. They stumble because they disobeyed the word as they were destined to do. The world hated Jesus unto death and will hate those who follow him. We can expect opposition. If we are faithful in following Jesus Christ, we can expect opposition. Let the gospel of Jesus Christ be the offense and not you. Do not be offensive in sharing your faith. But realize that your faith in Christ in itself may be an offense to others. 1 Peter 3.15 says, But in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. So, Christ first. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Important. Do this with gentleness and respect. Don't come across with a judgmental, I am better than you attitude. We share our faith with gentleness and respect to those who do not know. So fear is a great obstacle to people sharing their faith. But if we believe that Jesus is in control and we're letting fear stop us from sharing our faith in Him, then do we not have, not have more of a focus on ourselves than on Jesus? Because fear is based in self-protection. So that if we let fear rule our lives, we're focusing more on ourselves than we are on Jesus, right? So fear is a major obstacle. Number two, lack of Bible knowledge. And this leads to two things. Number one, there's a growing attitude in our society that people think that everyone leading a good life will go to heaven. You can be a good Buddhist, a good, a good Muslim, a, a, a good Hindu, but if you lead a good life, you're going to heaven, so I don't really need to share anything about Jesus with others because they're going to heaven anyway because they're leading a good life. Those who accept this teaching, and there's more and more of uh, young adults today who are accepting this teaching and who are not sharing their faith because they don't want to upset others. They, they feel others have a right to their beliefs, and so they don't share their own belief in Jesus Christ. So this goes against what Jesus said to himself in John 14, 6. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one come to the Father but through me. Well, that's pretty plain, plain that Jesus is saying there is no other way. No matter how good you lead your life, there's no other way but through him. And in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, those verses go against the belief that good works will lead you to heaven. Where it says salvation is a gift from God, not of works, at least anyone would boast. We cannot get to heaven by good works. So the teaching in our society and culture that everyone leading a good life is going to get to heaven is totally false. We see 
also that people use the excuse, I don't know enough to be able to tell others about Jesus. So they say, lack of knowledge. Well, if you have come to personal faith in Jesus Christ, all you need to know is to share is what Jesus has done for you, that he is the Son of God, that he died for us. John 3, 16. Jesus, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever would believe in him would not perish, but have eternal life. That is the essence of the gospel message. That is what we need to know to share. Or in Acts 4, 12, that there's no other name under heaven whereby man might be saved. That is the key information we need to know to share. So we can't say, well, I've got to keep learning and learning and learning, and I'll eventually get to the point where I have enough knowledge to be able to tell others about Jesus. If we use that excuse, we may never get to the point of knowing enough to tell others about Him. Remember also that if we say that we lack the knowledge and the ability to share that Jesus sent the Holy Spirit, the Counselor, who can give us the words to say. <coughs> Consistently, when I have shared my faith, God, by the Holy Spirit, has given me words specifically geared to the person that I'm sharing with, with knowledge that I have no way of knowing. Now, I can share with Elizabeth. When I shared with her three years ago a sentence from the science fiction book Dune, Fear is the Mind Killer, I did not know at that exact time she was reading that book. And so she could relate to what I shared. God gave me that knowledge to share that with her. As you share your faith, God will, by the Holy Spirit, give you supernatural knowledge to share with people who are separated from God. Sometimes you'll be, you'll be sitting, you know, it's almost like you're sitting back and, and the person is going, nodding their head with what they're sharing and you are sort of sitting back and inwardly you're nodding your head because you're hearing things come from your lips that are not from you. Isn't this encouraging? That we don't have to rely totally on our own knowledge? That the Holy Spirit of God can give us the wisdom as we share? In John 14, verses 16 to 18, Jesus said, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may be with you forever. That is the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. This is a promise. Not only do we have the promise from Jesus that he would never leave us, but we be with us to the end of the world, but we have the Holy Spirit of God also giving us information and giving us boldness in sharing our faith. Amen? So we can't say about having a lack of Bible knowledge. If we're not reading the Bible, yes, that's a great way to have a lack of Bible knowledge. And there are many people today who are biblically illiterate who do not know what's in the Bible because they're not reading the Bible. Number three, lack of urgency. If people die without having peace with God through faith in Jesus, they must be separated from God forever. Revelation 20, verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Does this not bother you? Does this verse not bother you? If anyone's name is not found written in the book of life, he will be thrown into the lake of fire. Versus, that's talking about people who have never come to personal faith in God, and personal faith in Jesus Christ. This is their destiny. This is what is ahead of them, whether it's family members, or neighbors, or fellow workers. If they are separated from God, this is their future. Do we not have a sense of urgency because of that? And a lot of times, many Christians do not have a sense of urgency. It's, it's an attitude of, so what? Let the pastor share the faith. 
Let the leaders of the church share the faith. Let people come and hear about the faith on TV. And they have no sense of urgency in sharing their faith. We could be that neighbor's, that family member's last opportunity to make their peace with God. Their last opportunity to come into a faith relationship with Jesus, the Prince of Peace, before they die. Or, if we are in the last days, it could be their last opportunity to make their peace with Jesus as Savior until He comes to this world as judge. Matthew 24. So, lack of urgency. Number four, lack of faith. Maybe you have faithfully shared the Word of God by word through your testimony, by print, written, Christian literature, or by social media, on Facebook, texting. You've shared your faith and you've seen no results. And you think, what is the point of sharing? I don't see anything happen. And we get discouraged and we stop sharing. Isaiah 55 and verse 11 says, It is the same with my word, God speaking, It is the same with my word. I send it out. He sends the word, his word out. And it always produces fruit. It will accomplish all I want it to, and it will prosper everywhere I send it. So as the word of God goes out, it has an impact on the lives of others. In Hebrews 4.12, it says that the word of God is not dead. It's living. For the Word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. God will work through His Word. Do I hear an amen? Amen. It is our responsibility to get the Word of God out to people. Amen? God will accomplish His purpose with His living Word as it is received in the hearts and minds of those who we share with. But we have to share it. There's a friend I know who gives out printed tracts every time he takes a taxi. He gives the taxi driver a track, a gospel message every time. And last year, he started to go whether that was having any impact because he hadn't seen any results. So he was thinking about stopping. And so just at that time, a taxi driver he had not seen in months picked him up. And he shared that a track that he would received from that man, the taxi driver took it home and, and posted it on his refrigerator. And one day his son came along and found the trap on the refrigerator, took the trap and read it, and came to faith in Christ. So just at the time he needed to be encouraged, he took that cab driver's taxi, who he hadn't seen for a long time, for, to hear that the message of God's word in the tracks he was given of, that God was working through those tracks. Fast track to a year later, and he's discouraged again about giving out tracks. And just at that time, he's picked up by another cab driver who he hasn't seen in a long time. And he starts talking to that cab driver who he has given a track to in the past. And the cab driver says to him, I have come to faith in Christ to a track that you gave me. That's twice. That at the point when he was discouraged, God said, look, see, you are being faithful and lives are being transformed because of your faithfulness in giving up my word. And I said to him, how many others have been transformed and impacted by your tracks that you don't even know about? How many people are receiving tracks and maybe giving those tracks to others? And others are coming to a faith in Christ. And one day in heaven you will know. And God, out of His grace, allowed you to see the impact. 
two different times, a lot passing out those tracks had on the lives of others. We need to look at ourselves and ask ourselves, why are we not telling others about Jesus? Are we hiding behind the attitude, we're too scared, which is a lack of trust in God? Are we hiding behind the aspect that we don't know enough? Well, the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say if we share our testimony. Are we having a lack of faith that God is not working through us as we share our, the Word of God? Or do we have that lack of urgency? We don't know how long we will be here to faithfully serve God. We do not know how long the people we share Christ with will be here. They can be gone tomorrow. And we may be the only person they know who are faithfully sharing faithfully serving God. Let me bring it down to a more direct level. Something you can remember. Just think that one day you are walking toward an intersection and the light has just turned red. But in front of you there is another person walking and they're talking on their cell phone. And they're not looking at anywhere or anything else but they're engaged in a really active conversation. And they continue walking into the intersection. And there's a car coming at a fast speed to go through the intersection. The question is, what would you do? Would you go and grab them and warn them? Or would you just say, oh, it's none of my business. I don't know them. It's not my responsibility. There must be a policeman around that, that, can, that can blow his whistle and stop must be someone else that can go and warn them. It's not, it's not my business. I don't know them. They might get offended if I interrupt their conversation. Or it might be someone that we go to a park and there's someone on the edge of a cliff with a selfie and they're trying to get their picture really centered and they don't see that they're going back too far and they're ready to fall off the cliff. Oh, it's not my, it's not my business. I don't, I don't know them. Uh, maybe there's someone else that will warn them. If we keep quiet. Isn't that the same way with those who are separated from God? They're approaching eternity. Separated forever from God. And we see where they are going. We see the danger they do not. And yet we've been called to warn them. True. We've been called to warn them. Whether they appreciate it or not, at the time, we've been called to warn them. If they listen to that warning, just like the person, person going back on, on, on the cliff and, and we yell out to warn them and they still ignore the warning and go off the cliff, it's not our fault because we have warned them. But they need to be warned. Jesus has called us as his ambassador to tell others about him. So he's told us to tell. He's commissioned us to tell people about him. Not even the angels are telling people about him. By his sovereign grace in parts of the world today where there is no Christian witness at all. There are no Christians to tell. Even today, Jesus is appearing in visions and dreams to Muslim, Muslims who are coming to faith in Christ. I've read stories in China and other countries where the same thing has happened. Jesus has appeared directly to people because there's no Christians there to share their faith. And I think how sad there are many parts of the world where there are no Christians who have gone to share their faith to those who are separated from God. And Jesus has to intervene directly out of his love and mercy and grace. What are we doing to tell others about him? Can't say we're too busy. Can't say we don't know enough. We 
because we do know it. Sometimes it only takes a few words to share, to get a person thinking. Sometimes it takes being sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit, changing our timetable. I didn't have to go and deliver tomatoes that day at your home. But I was in the community garden and then there were extra tomatoes and I saw tomatoes in the next plot that her mom and Jacqueline, I saw some extra tomatoes that would go to waste and I don't like seeing food go to waste. So I said, here are all these ripe tomatoes. So, so I know Jacqueline's further away than, than Marceline, so if I will go to Marceline, not knowing she's, she was home, I will take the tomatoes there. If they're not home, I'll hang them on the door. So she was home. How faithful are we in taking that extra time? And that was an act of kindness. But under that act of kindness, Elizabeth came to faith in Christ. So we never know what God will do in our life if we're available to Him. Amen? We never know. We just have to be sensitive. And as I said, shared before, when we meet people who are hungry for the Word of God, Satan will try to put barriers up to keep them from coming to God. I've shared before, when I was in Malawi, right in the bush, sharing with a, a, a mother, father, and, and young son, no other houses around, right in the bush, sharing through a translator, right at the point, and I made sure they understood, right at the point they were ready to come to personal faith in Christ, two men came along who were drunk, and one sat down, and I thought, just at the point they're ready to come to faith in Christ, these two drunks come along. I said, this is not coincidence. I asked how does they get lost in the local dialect, and the wife was trying to encourage him to go, and, and his friend was trying to encourage him to go, and finally he got up and he went, and that family came to faith in Christ, and I saw them baptized before I left. Malawi. Another time in New Brunswick, mother, father, and young son, I shared with them before about Jesus. There was a special meeting of an evangelist who came from the United States. They were going to go to the meeting that morning, and they let their dog out from their trailer. The dog went in the woods and it tangled with a skunk, and the skunk sprayed the dog, and the dog came back into the trailer. <laughs> so the trailer all smelled of skunk. Now they still cleaned themselves up and they avoided the fear of what people might smell. <laughs> and they came to the church and all three came forward that morning. I don't believe that dog tangled with that skunk for, for out of coincidence. So there's sometimes when we are sharing with someone that there may be a phone call, <laughs> there may be another, another interruption that will come right at that time, that's not by coincidence. It's an attempt to keep that person or people from coming to faith in Christ. We're involved in a spiritual battle. Satan is fighting to keep his hold on each person that he has in his kingdom. And this world is, is his kingdom. And he's fighting to keep control. So remember that when you share your faith, there may be things happen at the time that you're sharing. Things that happen to stop you from sharing your faith with that person. Oh, my, my, my cell phone is ringing. Um, maybe, maybe I better get my cell phone. Get that message, it might be important. There'll be things that will happen to try to get you off track of sharing your faith with a person who's ready to receive Jesus. Amen? Amen? It'll happen. It will happen. So are you telling others about Jesus? He's called us to tell others. Not an option. He's called us to share our faith. We may not see the results in this life. But one day we will. One day in heaven, we will meet our spiritual 
cousins and nephews and grandchildren, i.e. people who have come to Christ through others who have come to Christ through us. Isn't that exciting? That we will see people come to us who have then shared their faith and others who have come to faith in Christ to them because of coming to faith in Christ through our own sharing. That would be an exciting day. But we won't all see that now. It won't be until heaven. So we are to be faithful in continuing to pray to God for opportunities to share our faith when those opportunities come up. Is there sometimes we may connect with people and the day that we're sharing they may be like a, a piece of land that's been prepared for receiving the seed. A piece of land that's been plowed. The hard ground's been broken up and it's all ready to, for the seed to be put in. And once the seed's put in and the ground's covered over, you can't get any more seed in. <laughs> and there's some people that God will take us to, it's just like their hearts are like, it's like they've been plowed. Their hearts are open to receive the Word of God, the seed. And you meet that person a day or two later, and they're closed. They're not interested. There are God-given opportunities when God will take us to someone, and the heart is open, and the heart's prepared, right then and there, to receive the Word of God. Amen? Amen. We can't say, oh, let me look at my book, maybe next week. On Wednesday at 1 o'clock, we can meet, and then we can talk then, and, and Wednesday at 1 o'clock, oh no, I can't meet, I've got this meeting that's come up, and no, I'm no longer interested in talking about what we were talking about last week. The opportunity may pass. Take advantage of the opportunity God gives you to share when that opportunity presents itself. 1 Peter 3.15, always be ready to give an answer to the hope that is within you when you are asked. So it says we're always to be ready. And we're to give an answer right then and there. Especially when people come to us who have been prepared by the Holy Spirit, who are ready to come into the kingdom, but need to be shown how they can be accepted by God. Amen? Amen. We're the means of that happening. So always be open and always be ready for those opportunities that God gives you. And you will see the power of God working in and through you and you will see the lives of others being transformed and changed as you faithfully serve. Amen? Let us pray. Lord, help us not to get discouraged. Help us to be encouraged that as we faithfully serve you, you will work in and through our lives to transform and change others. We are under observation 24-7. By others, others who are separated from God, who are looking at us to see what makes us different. Lord, may they see the living Christ in us. May they see that what we say and what we do brings honor to you. And may what they see in us, combined with their knowledge that we serve Jesus, may that cause them to ask us a reason for why we believe. And that we may have an opportunity to share with them. Lord, give us wisdom. As we have the desire to share with others. We thank you for what you will do in and through us as we are faithful and obedient to what you have called us to do in being your witnesses. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Told to tell. Are you telling? Are you telling others about Jesus? Yeah, we can tell others about soap operas. We can tell others about the weather. We can tell others about food recipes. We can tell others about sports events. But are we telling others about Jesus? Sports events will one day stop. We'll be in a place one day where there's no weather, weather problems. We'll be in a place one day where we won't need to eat, so there's no issue on recipes. And we'll be in a place one day that's better than any so far. How are we using our time? I'm not saying we live in a bubble. There are things that we can enjoy. We can enjoy food recipes and we can enjoy all these things. The problem comes in is if we enjoy those things so much that we have no time to share our faith with others. Has God spoken to your heart this morning? You have a greater passion, a greater desire. To be that ambassador for Christ. 
to be that representative for the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. If you have that passion, that greater desire, even this morning, you can say, Lord, I want to be used more of you. I want to be more faithful in sharing my faith. I want to surrender my fear, my hesitancy, my excuses, and be more obedient to what you have called me to be. If I spoke in your heart this morning, I invite you to come, and I can have a prayer with you. If you want to be more passionate and more dedicated, because this is not an option. This is not an option. Not an option at all. More dedicated to sharing your faith. Not assuming that others will come to know. But God may use us in our families to share our faith with those within our own families or within our neighborhood or with people we work with or with someone we just happen to meet on the bus and we're taking a long bus trip and we start a conversation up. Or with someone at Tim Hortons or other place that we, we go to and the conversation ends up going into spiritual matters and they ask us questions about Jesus. We never know what God will provide for us and what situation we're in, but we're to be ready. Let us pray. Lord, I just pray that you will help us to be more open to those opportunities that we have to share our faith. I just pray, pray for Jacqueline. I pray for Elizabeth. I pray for Gloria. I pray for Christian. I pray, Lord, for each one. You have uniquely placed each one of them among those who do not know you. And you have built relationship connections at work, at school, in the neighborhood, in the family. You've put them in relationships. Through those relationships, you will provide them opportunities with gentleness and respect to be able to share their faith with those who do not know you. So I just pray that you will give them that urgency, give them that lack of fear, but the boldness that comes from the Holy Spirit, and give them that ability to be in tune with the Holy Spirit, to continue to pray for those that they know that do not know you, that Lord, that you will open up hearts and open up minds with those who we know, that they may have that curiosity and that interest to know the reason why we believe, to know how they can make their peace with God through Jesus Christ. So help each one here to be more passionate about you. For our time is going by very quickly. We don't know individually how long we will be here. We don't know individually how long others will be here. We don't know, Lord, when you're coming back. We don't know how much time we will have to have the freedom to openly share our faith in this country of Canada. Lord, help us to be wise. Help us to have a desire to be soul winners, to be your ambassadors, to be faithful to you. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. And now... May we be that light. Amen. May we reflect Jesus, Amen. who is the light of the world. Amen. In a world that is becoming darker and darker and darker, may we shine for Jesus. May we shine into someone's life in this coming week. We ask this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen.